Hi there, I'm Francis Vigent, and this is my colleague, Judy Higgins. Um, today, we're going to be talking about why we need to conquer fear, uncertainty, and doubt as adults in the classroom. And just as way of introduction, um, Judy is a professional learning specialist here at No Adam uh, and used No Adam as a teacher in her classroom for how many years, Judy? I fall oh, hard. Six. I about six years. And I taught with No Adam uh, about seven years, and I've been with No Adam uh, almost 18 years now. So it's been a little while. But in this discussion, um, we want to focus on fear, uncertainty, and doubt within the adults. And, and how fear, uncertainty, and doubt affects our, our teaching, how it affects our decision-making, how it affects the culture of thinking, of learning, of growing in our schools, uh, in ourselves as professionals, and in our students, because that's why we're there. So I wanted to um, put that out there to you all. And I guess, Judy, as we kind of start down this path of um, unpacking these ideas, what are sort of some of the initial thoughts you have around why fear, uncertainty, and doubt is so important to recognize and think about now more than ever? Mm. Francis and I, we talk about this a lot, what it does to teaching. And we talk a lot about the pressure that's on teachers for the testing that's going to happen, for the expectations of parents, administrators. And it makes it really hard and confusing for a teacher where we have certain thoughts about what we want our classroom to look like. We want our classroom to be fun, full of curious students, full of eager students, students who are going to ask great questions. But as a teacher, I always remember knowing that that test was looming over me and that I felt really responsible. And I would often find myself not doing things that I wanted to do, but doing things that I felt this is going to help everyone do well on the test. Mm -hmm. And that didn't feel good. It never felt good, but it felt, oof, this is what I have to do. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's hard. It's, it's a hard thing, particularly if you're doing something that's really going well and the students are really enjoying this. But I find myself thinking, but are they getting what I want them to get? Are they going to remember this? And kind of forgetting everything that I knew about learning and understanding and focusing on, but will they be able to give this back next week, next month? Will they remember it? for a month. Yeah. And I, you know, what you're talking about resonates with me because I, I remember that same feeling. I remember, um, I remember the lead up. So when I was teaching in New Hampshire, we had the New England Common Assessment Program, which was a precursor. So that was a uh, state test students had to pass, um, or not pass, but I mean, it just, it was a summative assessment. Um, so they would, they would receive the score that they received. And, and the thing about it was that um, there was always this sort of in the back of my mind, okay, the test is here. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> like, I don't. I don't know what's going to happen. And I and and I felt this sort of that you know I don't skydive. I don't bungee jump. But there, if I did, I would imagine it's that feeling you have at the moment of I'm exiting the plane. I'm 
I'm, you know, jumping off this thing with the spongy cord. Um, hope it, hope it works. Hope it mm -hmm. works. Um, because the, you, you leave that place of comfort, um, and whatever it will be, will be. And, and I, I remember saying to myself, driving to school many times, uh, in the different years leading up to testing for that year, it would be like, I've got to trust the kids. You know, I have to trust, I know, I know the skills that they've built. Um, I can see the growth that they've made. I have to trust them that they are going to perform. And that is that kind of, it, it's very unsettling it, it because you have, it, it's uncertainty, I guess is what we're talking about. That's the uncertainty part. And the fear part is, to your point, I'm responsible for these kids. So if if they don't make it, if they don't score well, if they don't get whatever, I'm afraid I haven't done my job. And I'm in and the uncertainty around whether I have done my job for some people, it, it, it drives them to do things that they don't believe in, that they don't, um, mm. You know, it's sort of like it's I think it's almost like and this is maybe a strange analogy, but it's like people overpacking for a trip. You know, it's the uncertainty. Will I need this? The fear. Can I get this? The the doubt about if I leave it here, am I going to be in trouble? Better take it. And so you go away for a three day weekend with 10 bags instead of a backpack and you cause yourself all of this, you know, like burden and expense and so on and so forth. And then at the end of the day, I guess you had it, but what was the value? Did it, did you really benefit? Um, I don't but know. But you just said something so great and it made me think so much when you said, and I've never thought of this, this way, you said, do I trust the students? And as you said that, I realized like, that's what this is all about is I did have trouble trusting my students because I wasn't releasing responsibility. I wasn't, I wasn't helping them with the ability to take a test and not worry about it, with the ability to transfer whatever we had learned in the classroom to the test. And I think you, you captured that so well, because I think that was a lot of what was going on, certainly in my classroom is I wasn't trusting what I was teaching. I wasn't trusting that they were really understanding anything. I was giving them a lot of things and maybe they were able to spin it back, but were they able to make any connections? Because you can't teach them. You can't give them everything they're going to get in the test. We don't know what's in the test, first of all. Right. Right. We speculate, but that's, when you said that, I realized that was when my teaching changed, when I truly started trusting my students' ability to learn and their ability to figure things out. Uh -huh. And they started trusting themselves, even more importantly, that they weren't all hung up on, I don't know how to do this. Uh -huh. they, they started to realize we're learning all kinds of ways to think about things uh -huh. and now I can make connections. Uh -huh. And that happened as I started again, backing off uh -huh. and giving them the floor, letting them have the discussions, letting them learn, letting them make connections. And I saw that happen in my classroom with the big test it suddenly wasn't this big deal that nobody could breathe that morning mm -hmm. that I mean it was even fun that there was there was some cockiness that went on mm -hmm. before the test. 
that was just so delightful that it was like, nah, this is no big deal. Mm -hmm. What a change that was between this like gruesome silence in the mm -hmm. classroom and, you know, my tension that I'm sure wasn't helping any of them mm -hmm. at all because mm -hmm. I was just a wreck like looking around. <laughs> Gosh, they look so confused. What am I going to do? I can't do sure. anything. Oh, and yeah, the, the parachute analogy was great. Sure. Um, so I think that, you know, looking at our behavior, looking at, you know, what, how did we let this test take over everything? Exactly, because that, it, it, that's exactly it. Because I think that... Um, I think I think that there's this type of professional anxiety that occurs where and I think you see it in ELA and math it's the reason why time keeps getting poured into ELA and math cannibalizing the rest of time on learning for anything else everything else recess art stem science social studies whatever the time for ELA and math grows and grows and grows and grows and grows and as if as if pouring more time on the same things is going to produce greater outcomes um and and the 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 thing about it is is that it comes from a place of anxiety it's it's well, the kids aren't doing well enough in ELA, they aren't doing well enough in math, and therefore we need to put more focus on it. More focus equals more time. But it's not necessarily looking at the big picture holistically and saying, what is the, what is the marginal gain for this additional time? What is the, what is the yield for, for the time we're already spending? I mean, it's, it's it, you know, okay, kids are, are partially proficient. Well, let's dial into the practices. Let's dial into the engagement. Let's dial into these other things that that impact that. Um, and what I think about in a lot of ways is that I think I think about Angela Duckworth actually and her research around grit, and and I think about. She she has a few of these like very uh, sort of simple phrases she uses. One is um, that that skill is just effort behind talent. That's it. So some we all have varying amounts of talent. You know, we we some of us may be naturally inclined to. Um, like math or. Um, memorize or remember things and you know perhaps acquire language uh, a little more easily or in science perhaps we're just more naturally inclined to be curious about the world around us or something but whatever level of 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 talent we have it it's the effort that we put behind that talent that produces skill and she talks about how effort put behind skill translates into achievement. And what I what I kind of hear you saying in a sense is that trust or I guess where the connection I draw to what you said a little earlier is that trusting students is is believing that all students have some level of talent in all areas. And so by trusting them and creating a an, a classroom environment that reduces responsibility to them and challenge that challenges them and encourages them and supports them to put effort behind the talents that they have, whether it's teeny, 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 we can turn teeny, teeny, teeny into big skill with a lot mm -hmm. of effort. Mm -hmm. If somebody has huge amounts of talent, we can turn that into lots of skill, perhaps with less effort. That's nice, but you know what? It still takes effort. And, and, and at the end of the day, whatever the, so we have to, we have, we have to trust students have the ability to your point. We have to create the environment for putting effort 
behind that and the challenge. And, and that's where I think where, you know, learning happens at the point of challenge. Um, that's our role. And that's the skill development. But then we actually need to, we need to challenge those skills. We need to release the responsibility so that students actually achieve. And kind of, I guess, coming back full circle, this other connection I feel like I'm making to what you said is that that if we if we are overly anxious, if we are overly fearful, and we are overly doubtful of students' ability, we take control. We yeah. take we take the opportunity to put effort behind those talents, whatever those talents are, away. And so the skill development doesn't happen. And then because the skill development doesn't happen, as professionals, we fear and our uncertainty about students' ability to achieve because we look at this lack of skill that we perceive, which may or may not be justified, but we perceive this. And so we don't, we don't, create an environment of challenge for student skills. So the yeah. achievement doesn't happen. So this like fear, uncertainty, doubt is this negative feedback cycle that drives us to do things that that aren't helpful. And I and and yeah. that's why I was relating it to the ELA and math because I think I think we see that a lot you know especially with english learners we say oh the kids have no talent in english <laughs> they have no they have no ability like how do we you know and so they we preempt we preempt success <laughs> i don't know maybe that I'm, I'm talking too much well no 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 i think it's i think it's important because i think as what we're saying is that we've got to provide an atmosphere for students to be able to become curious, to be able to seek learning, to be able to be willing to struggle so they can learn. And you've got to create that environment. Mm -hmm. And we have to do the same thing for teachers. I mean, teachers, the expectation on teachers is that they're going to quickly create these environments. And again, that's that's hard for seasoned teachers. Mm -hmm. when it's very skillful, it requires skill. So much, but it also, and that takes time, is whether you're a brand new teacher starting, or you're a teacher who is presented with a new curriculum that they have to learn, or you're a teacher who, you know, I was teaching ELA, now I'm needed to teach science, so I have to learn that. Mm -hmm. The expectation on us is just like the big test for the students. Mm -hmm. You have to learn all of this. You have to learn it immediately. You have to do it well. So what can... I throw at you that you're going to be able to do that without giving. And, th and that's, I watched my journey as a teacher, both in changing schools, changing curriculums, changing, you know, what I was teaching and all of those things took time. And once I either was given that time or thought, I just, I just have to, I have to give myself the time. I'm not going to do this perfectly this year, uh -huh. period. Uh -huh. And my students may not show great gains in the big end of year test because I'm still figuring it out. But, and this was something I would have to assure my administration of where I'm on, I'm on a roll. I'm getting how to teach this new curriculum. Uh -huh. And it's really good. And the students are starting to think differently. Uh -huh. It's not a show overnight, uh -huh. but I can. And, and again, we've, we've got enough data that shows, you know, what will work for testing. We can do both those things. We can have a curious, exciting classroom uh -huh. and not teach to the test 
and still do well on the test. We have that data. We see right. it. But again, it takes time. It's not going to show necessarily this year. I'll see it in my classroom this year, how they're doing as I walk around and have conversations and do that sort of assessment. I can see okay. they're getting things. This okay. is this is different. I'm okay. seeing real understanding going okay. on. I'm seeing connections being made. I'm seeing perspectives changing. Okay. Okay. So it's helping. We all need to be working together to understand okay. For uh -huh. you know, administration seeing this is a new teacher uh -huh. and things are going well, uh -huh. but not, maybe you're not going to see the outcome on that uh -huh. in the test. Uh -huh. So it's you know looking at both giving students the time uh -huh. to learn, uh -huh. giving teachers the time. Right, right, right. Well, and I, but I mean, I what I hear you saying, and I think it's also though important to point out is like. Two things. One, I, I guess I hear you saying that um, you have to invest. You have to you have to take the leap. You have to invest yourself, the effort yes. behind making changes in your practice to releasing responsibility to creating learning opportunities that you may be uncomfortable with or that may may um, trigger fear, uncertainty, and doubt for you mm -hmm. as a practitioner because you don't know what the impact will be on the test. But, but if you can sort of take the perspective that this is not going to be perfect, but I'm making this investment because this is pushing us in the right direction, I can accept that perhaps all the gains aren't going to be seen this year. Perhaps the gains will be delayed or, you know, as I'm adjusting and students are adjusting and so on. But, but, I mean, I, I think as was was your experience and my experience is that when you make those shifts, you do see the gains. I, you know, you had some of the top scores in your district, which you taught in an urban district that, you know, 80, 90 plus percent ELA, free reduced lunch. It was, you know, a real, real urban school district um, with the challenges of an urban environment. Um, I also... Uh, you know, had a class of students that I was responsible for. And I think um, our, our testing came in, actually, it's interesting. I, when I was teaching, science testing started during my time teaching um, in the state of New Hampshire. So I believe um, five years we were tested. And so uh, I think three out of the five years, we were in the top five and we were number one, number two um in the state um different years so the long and short of it is is and and i know the clients that use no adam um, and where i live here in massachusetts two out of the top three in the state on mcas testing use no adam they use no adam for like 10 years or maybe more than that so it's my point in saying all this is is that the fear uncertainty and doubt is real yeah and to your point, in order to take the leap, we have to recognize that we may not get the outcome we want immediately, that we are taking a risk, but there's efficacy data to say that actually that risk is well justified and that the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, while it's real, may actually be a logical fallacy that, that, we, that our anxiety may be driving us toward things that are negative for learning and professional growth, as opposed to toward things that are beneficial um, and, and would reduce this anxiety. And I think that that's where, again, this, in my coping process saying, I need to trust the children because I know, I know what I see in them. I know, I know the skill and the effort that we've put behind what they brought into the classroom and they are in a much different place. And so um, the, you know, the effort that we've put behind that skill in creating an environment where they can practice this on an everyday basis as scientists and engineers, they've produced high levels of achievement on an everyday basis. How is that not, how is that not going to count on a performance-based test? I have to right. trust them. And you know what? It did. 
um, and it did for you too. I know it does for others, but I think coming back to what we were talking about a minute ago, um, it's like, it's the same, you said, you know, we need to, like as teachers, we need to engage in sort of the same thing that we're engaging, trying, we say we should engage the students in. And I think about it as putting effort behind our talents to develop new skills um, and to put effort behind the skills that we have to, to make new achievements. That's what I think about, like when I think about a new program or we think about the shift to the next generation science standards or to performance-based testing and, and next generation teaching and learning, it's, we're all talented teachers you know, we've, we've, we've opted into this profession. Um, we have built some skill set, but we can't stop putting effort behind those things if we want to achieve different outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. If we want to develop new skills, we have to go back to the basics and put more effort behind the talents we have. We need to put more effort behind the skills we have, practice them, so that you know we can achieve new and different things with our kids. Um, I mean, what are, like what are your thoughts about that? And I and I wonder like why why do you think that we're facing this sort of like what feels like a, a greater period of doubt and uncertainty and fear these days than in the past? Well, you know, one of the things that I, I keep thinking about in so many of the, you know, as we're talking about fear and doubt and uncertainty and how teaching is becoming for a lot of teachers just not joyful, not, oh, this is not what I signed up for. And I think about something that was another big shift in my teaching was the ability to connect with other teachers and learn from other teachers and support each other. And teaching became more and more lonely, I felt, as the pressure started and everybody was just kind of in their bunker. And teachers who didn't have to worry about end of year testing kind of, I always felt like they just get to do their own thing. They don't have to worry about anything. Mm. And there became this real difficulty between testers and non-testers that it was like people, teachers would talk about, I feel very unsupported. And, you know, they're, they're not teaching enough to help my students. And I started seeing this a lot during when I was working with a lot of different schools with professional development where teachers would be saying that outright. You know, mm -hmm. well, they don't worry about this. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I felt was really profound for me is when I started talking with other teachers mm -hmm. and they, asking questions about what is scary. I'm so scared right now because I'm not giving my students what they need. I don't know how to do it. I feel a lot of pressure. I don't, I don't know what's happening in the grade before and the grade after because I'm so focused on what I have to do now. And when those conversations started, it was amazing. And that took so much of fear, doubt, and uncertainty because I can talk with teachers who had a lot more experience than I did. Mm -hmm. And I could start asking questions about, well, you know, what is it that that is being highlighted in this grade level? And when we could start working together, so it wasn't us against the test, us against administration, us against another grade level, that we were supporting each other and learning from each other. Mm -hmm. And everything started making more sense to me then. Mm -hmm. 
And it became, this was one of the ways that I started feeling a lot more joy where I wasn't teaching by myself. Mm -hmm. We're all teaching. We all cared about this. We all became excited. And when we could start having conversations about, oh, so I should probably start focus more on this, mm -hmm. that I realized it wasn't the other teachers weren't doing nothing. They weren't mm -hmm. just playing. They were teaching, but mm -hmm. they weren't thinking about right. where this was going. Right. And I think that's one of the, the biggest gifts that I felt like came to me when I realized it's not all on my shoulder mm -hmm. to teach the water cycle. Mm -hmm. They're going to see this again. Mm -hmm. So it's okay mm -hmm. if I'm just making them curious about it. Some mm -hmm. students will be learning and understanding a lot. Some only a little bit, but that's okay. They're going to revisit it. And I think that's so important as we think about teaching and learning and understanding, understanding how we don't have to do it all. Mm -hmm. We do our part. We do our part well. Mm -hmm. And and take that pressure off. I'm I'm helping create these opportunities. All my students can enter this at different levels. Mm -hmm. but they're they are learning how to think mm -hmm. they're learning how to have conversations they're learning how to consider different perspectives mm -hmm. that's going to serve them so well as they move into the next grade and the next grade mm -hmm. and once we as teachers learned how to help students have conversations mm -hmm. and talk about things Mm -hmm. Help students know it's okay not to understand this. In mm -hmm. fact, I can bring it to the group and say, mm -hmm. can somebody help me understand this? Mm -hmm. What a frame for both students and teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I hear you saying um, sparks a lot of connections for me and my experience too, because uh, I, I did have the benefit of wonderful mentors that when I was starting teaching, you know, they were uh, toward the end of their teaching career. And I feel like the, I feel like a lot of what we've talked about so far today and what you're talking about now, it, it, it connects to instructional vision. And it's a, and, and when I think about mentors and of these of teaching communities and the kind of discussions that we have when we can connect as teachers with other teachers in our building other teachers in other buildings in our different district and other grade levels is the opportunity to develop a language of what we value as a community and what our instructional vision is to share instructional visions um, and actually, in some ways, develop one, because it's very, if, if you take, you know, five people and you lock them in a classroom for a year um, without any opportunity or, you know, credible, regular, um, structured opportunity to share uh, language and values and, and work against a vision, develop a vision, everybody ends up with their own idea, their own mm -hmm. vision. It's isolated, it's siloed. And so people become focused on what they believe the job is. And yeah. the problem is, is that if everybody has a different idea of what the job is, or if the shared language is, God forbid, these kids are unteachable, these kids are damaged. These kids do not have talent. They do not have language. They do not have parents. They do not have, you know, like there are so many things that we could point at a group of children and say they don't have. If that goes in the, the other direction, that, that, that creates a vision that is not productive. Mm -hmm. And 
And and so when I think about getting folks outside the classroom to connect with others, it creates an opportunity for somebody who may be going down a dark path to see alternatives, to see a better way. But at the same time, it creates leadership opportunities for those who are having successes, who are taking risks, who are making the leap and are trusting the kids to say, you know what? Yeah, it's unsettling. Like you're saying earlier, you know, it's unsettling. I don't know what's going to happen. But when I trust the kids, things do happen. And so how mm -hmm. much, you know, like, why do you, like, how much of this do you think is related to instructional vision? And, and why do you think instructional vision is, is suffering right now? Well, I think so much of what keep, we keep coming back to is we're in our classrooms and we have, we have thoughts mm -hmm. and we're mostly very hard on ourselves as teachers. And we feel like we don't have time to go out and look at other situations. And, and I, other jobs have time like this. Other jobs, people get together often. And I tell this story often. I think it was, it was so important towards my development where I had connected with some other teachers. It was amazing. I was brand new in a district. I was teaching a new curriculum. I was teaching, it was, I was so far out of my comfort zone. And, but I got together with a lot of teachers and we were all learning the new curriculum together. So this one teacher was going to try to have a discussion because that was something new that we were learning. And she was a very seasoned teacher. And so I took a risk and I said, can I come watch? And she said, well, yes, you absolutely can, but it's my first time doing it. So I have no idea what it's gonna be, be like. Well, good on her. I mean, that's amazing. I was always afraid to let anyone into my classroom or at least I thought it's gonna be awesome. Sure. So I thought, it's great. So I went, I watched, and she was in the same school district. So it was, you know, we had similar classrooms. And I loved every minute of it. I was taking notes like crazy. I had so many ideas. And I'll never forget this because the students left. She sat down and she said, well, that was mortifying. And I went, <laughs> what? And she said, oh, she said, I just, you know, they didn't do anything that we had talked about and they weren't prepared. And I, I was like, okay. I have a completely different perspective here because I saw this, I saw that. And then when this one said this to that one, and it was amazing. And, and it was so incredible because it, it made me laugh because I thought this is so funny because you had your perspective. I had my perspective. How great is it? Because she had seen nothing but everything that was mortifying to her. So she had missed all the good parts. I could, as a teacher who was terrified to do this, and I'm thinking, first time, if I can get my kids halfway there. I, so it inspired me that, okay, she was very vulnerable. Yeah, sure, I get that she thought things were messy, but I saw so much goodness. I am absolutely trying this tomorrow and transform my classroom once we started having discourse. And, and I never turned back from it. And yeah, it was messy often. But that ability to connect as teachers and, and that also taught me because I thought I will never wait again until I have a perfect lesson to let people into my classroom. This is so important for us as teachers to get together, to support, to critique each other. And, and that became really powerful in my building because 
I did have administration who was able to listen. And when I said, like, we need to do more of this, get in each other's classrooms, talk about, you know, things that we're working on mm -hmm. that are helping the classroom environment, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. seeing learning. So even if it's not the focus of my scores were terrible, mm -hmm. I'm terrified, mm -hmm. I've just had to focus. Mm -hmm. And that stopped being the focus, which mm -hmm. really transformed, you know, instructional vision and culture mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. you know, in the classrooms that, and we weren't just talking to, I'm only going to talk to the fifth grade teachers. No, mm -hmm. let's, you know, let's invite the second grade teachers so we can be looking at how we're going to deal with this. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, going back to, when I could see everybody was scared and, you know, wasn't sure, not everyone, but that we could share those feelings mm -hmm. and we could share our successes. We could share our issues that it's like, you know, mm -hmm. and I see often now in trainings, that's always so exciting to me when we'll go into each other's classrooms and teachers will say, to each other. I had that student three years ago mm -hmm. and it was so amazing to watch them in the classroom, to watch their confidence, to watch, you know, mm -hmm. them working with others. Mm -hmm. How great that that mm -hmm. teacher would have known mm -hmm. that yes, there, there was so much improvement going on and students were learning. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I think that so many of these things that we're talking about can be helped with giving teachers time to mm -hmm. collaborate, to mm -hmm. work productively together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I'd like to add to that is because I completely agree with, with what you're saying. I guess what I'd like to add to that is, is the reason that this is so vital, what you're saying, the reason that creating, it's not just creating the time, but it's actually making the task within that time focused on thinking about why we're doing what we're doing, what we value about what we're doing and how we're doing it and getting in to see others in action in our schools and in our districts, peer to peer. The reason that that is so vital is that represents the fabric of an instructional vision, the way that it's built, it's maintained, it's propagated. And, and what, what that fundamentally does is shape the definition of the work that we're doing as teachers and as administrators. So when I'm in my classroom, when I'm doing my job, I have a different idea of what that job is and what success and effectiveness looks like when I'm connected to a larger instructional vision that's shared, that's, that's deeper than just where I might go myself from behind closed doors with limited information and perspective and connection, especially mm -hmm. as I might, in my isolation behind a closed door, have fear, have uncertainty, have doubts. When I am connected to these other folks and we are, we are intentionally focusing on what we value, what the vision for instruction is, what that should look like, what that should feel like. Should there be responsibility uh, released to students? Why? Like these are not just things that we do, we do them for a purpose. And so by doing that, I, become connected to this greater picture, but I can take that back and I can, I can work against it because now I don't have uncertainty as to whether or not I should do something because I've seen others do it. Mm -hmm. I see my administrators mm -hmm. value this and I see this as, as something I can do in a skill I can build if I just put effort behind the talents that I have. Yeah. And that that I you know it's like you go into somebody's classroom like I'm you know you go into this classroom you see these things and you say well, you know that was great 
I think I can do that even better. <laughs> so, you know, so you're like, like, if I just put a little more effort behind the skill I have, I can achieve more than they're achieving with my kids. Because if they can do that in third grade, I can certainly do that in more in fourth grade or, you know, in fifth grade. And so, so to me, that is a huge way for teachers to conquer and, and, and even administrators to conquer fear, uncertainty, doubt, or FUD. You know, sometimes people call this FUD um, because that's the, the, the ingredients panic. Like we don't want panic in our schools. We don't want people reacting and teaching and, and treating students from a state of panic. And, and I think, you know, something I maybe just a, a brief point to reflect on is, is I think that one of the unfortunate things as a result of all of the shock and trauma of COVID, you know, we see since the beginning of COVID to now, many districts have seen upwards of 80 or 90% turnover in their districts, in both administrators and teachers. And it's probably no, it's probably no surprise to folks that instructional vision tends to live and develop amongst the spear carriers who are the more seasoned or um, folks who have been in a district longer. You know, they are, they ride to leadership levels, you know, superintendents come and go, principals are there for many years. Um, teaching teams, members may come and go, but there are core folks who are there for many years of their career. They tend to be anchors within instructional vision. And so when you look at these huge amounts of turnover that have happened, a lot of those folks have retired. They've moved on. They're not there anymore. And so I think now more than ever, instructional vision has become scattered, fractured, undefined. Yes. It's back to a bunch of people treading water behind closed doors in their own classrooms. And and it impacts teaching and learning in the ways that we're describing because people don't necessarily, they're not connected to each other in a way that they're able to get a deep vision for instruction. And so oftentimes, especially for you know, new folks, maybe operating from a very basic concept of what the work is. And we need to redefine that. We really need to look at that as teams as like, what is the work that we're doing in our classroom? Is it, is it, you know, is it just trying to get kids past a test? Because even if we do, what's the value of that? Mm -hmm. Who do we want these kids to be as a result of their time with us? Yeah. Well, and just a quick point, because I think it's interesting where everything about teaching and learning today is about students collaborating learning from each other, having discourse. Why are we not doing the same for teaching? I mean, right. we've got so much data that shows how much students grow and learn when they have a conversation. And it's remarkable to me when I look at teams of teachers who go into each other's classrooms, who collaborate, who talk productively about, you know, lessons that they've taught, successes that they've had, reflect on, ooh, you know, this, this thing didn't go well at all. Let's help me, help me with this. Right. And it's amazing that we're, we're not making those connections faster. Because again, when I work with schools where teachers are working together from all grade levels. It's, it is just dazzling to see, just like with students after a great conversation and just like, that was so satisfying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so much learning went on. The same thing happens with teachers. I mm -hmm. see, you know, such a change in attitudes and vision. And they can say, okay, I feel so supported right now. And that's a great idea where suddenly, you know, a, a teacher who's just struggling and frustrated uh -huh. and she'll just vent her struggle and frustration. And all of a sudden she's got all these peers, you know, well, I, I tried this when I had that and you just see 
the everything is uplifted and she'll say those are really good ideas and it's just it's so exciting and I think we we need to think about that for teachers and for teachers to ask for that you deserve uh -huh. that and this right. is working with students let's I want to have the same opportunities to learn and grow and understand and not just be wallowed in panic uh -huh. as you said because we we are not our best selves when we are in panic no no and that's exactly it it, it it's to the one of the early points we made is that that functioning in a state of panic causes people to make rationally irrational decisions and the outcomes are suboptimal because it's not our best selves it's not our it's not what we are capable of at our best purely because we're acting out of fear of something that we hope doesn't happen, not something that will happen, that we know will happen, that it's just something we're afraid of, a potential. And um, yeah, what you just shared also sort of, I guess, makes me want to make sure that folks, you know, hearing this conversation, don't get the wrong impression that, you know, the, 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 the message here is not okay, Mr. Mrs. Administrator, um, what you need to do is go and draft some lofty instructional vision and go hand it to everybody um, and tell them that this is what we're doing. Um, what, we're, what we're saying to folks here, I think, is instead of pouring more minutes on ELA, pour more minutes on math, um, you know, trying to um, find the silver bullet in a science program or something like this, the number one thing you can do is recognize that fear, uncertainty, and doubt exists among teachers and even administrators. And you need to create a space and a structure to begin developing a tribal language. It's already there, but you need to surface it and you need to begin vetting it and unpacking it. And as a team lean into this challenge, which is why are we doing what we're doing? And what do we really value about yes. the work? Because that's the thing, it, we need to agree on what the work is so that when, mm -hmm. when we go into each other's classroom, we know whether we know whether we are meeting our own values and we can help each other and ourselves to point to things that we want to do and point to things that we don't want to do, because that's going to help us make better decisions. And, and, you know, I, I think about this as we, you know, we're having this conversation as, as two folks um, that are, you know, uh, former teachers focus on science and next generation science standards here. And I think about how woefully inadequate, like the, the discussion and decision-making process often is around programming. And I think about, I think about situations where um, teams are looking for a program to, to solve, a program with a vision to solve a, la a problem of a lack of vision and communication. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, is programs, as wonderful as any program could be, can only support the vision that's there and only support the language and support the values. Um, what happens in the classroom is entirely entirely up to the individual to act against the values that they, they hold for the, what the work is. And that's the thing. If the work is show a video, make kids go, ooh, or get, an, get the right, get a, a particular answer to a particular question on a worksheet, that's that's one way of looking at something vision wise and valuing it. But if the vision is more about developing students as thinkers, their independence, their agency, um, we need to understand 
amongst ourselves why we value those things and that we value them and begin talking about looking for the ways that we reflect those values in the work that we're doing. And that's, I think, where the where it breaks down. And especially post-COVID, as so many people have moved quickly into administrative positions to fill needs that are real important needs, um, there hasn't been the time even to recognize that these discussions are so important. Yes, agreed. So given that, I guess we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about these things. How do you think we can bring more joy into teaching? Because I think one of the, pro one of the other benefits of these sort of discussions is that when we know why we're doing what we're doing and we clearly understand what the work is and what we value, the fear, the uncertainty, the doubt goes away because we have permission to take these risks. We know what we're looking for. We know what others are looking for. It takes a lot of anxiety out of it. What's the connection to, to, to joy here? When you can, when you can step back because you've been able to release responsibility and watch your students at work. And I can think of times where we were having a whole class discussion and me being able to, I, there was one discussion that I remember so well and it was, and I had been doing this for a while. So I, I had a lot of tools to help them get to where they where they were, to be able to have a discussion, to be vulnerable. And I remember sitting back and just watching. I was part of the group and I might join in the discussion as part of that discussion. I, I wasn't even being a teacher and trying to make the discussion go anywhere because it was it was such a great discussion and listening to these students talk with each other respectfully, being able to support everything that they were able to say, being able to argue productively with each other. So much joy. And I can literally, I can picture that to this day, what that felt like in that classroom that is joy mm -hmm. and recognizing, yeah, work went into this, but it was mm -hmm. so worth it. And I think that's mm -hmm. the thing. You don't have enough time mm -hmm. to be able to step back as a teacher and watch. Mm -hmm. And I also remember being in another classroom, another teacher's classroom and watching the students and they were, they were all, busily at work creating and you know working on a prototype and the the energy in the classroom was so incredible and the excitement and the intelligence and I just wandered around and sat down with students and would ask a question or two and I mean talk about joy and being able to watch that particular teacher as she kind of walked around her classroom mm -hmm. asking questions, the mm -hmm. joy on her face. And it was so exciting to watch that, to think this is you, you earned that, you earned mm -hmm. every minute of that. Mm -hmm. So take it, relax. Mm -hmm. Don't worry that I'm in here and that other people are in here. Mm -hmm. So to make sure you, you know, you have that vision sit back and enjoy it. You don't always have to be anxiously walking around looking for, you know, like what else could go wrong? Just right. breathe, breathe into it and find that, find that and help each other find that, find that in each other's classrooms because mm -hmm. that's important to point out to mm -hmm. other teachers. What a great thing that just mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I know we're at time here, so I, I want to uh, be mindful of folks' time. But um, just in sort of wrapping up, I, I would not only agree, but I guess I would add to that how, how, how wonderful it is to be able to focus the task of our jobs on the things that we value most about 
impacting students for the long term, for the long haul, and mm -hmm. how um, freeing it is to feel supported and connected to everybody else who's trying to move in the same direction. And at the same time, knowing that, that, you know, I'm not, um, you know, some machine that's, you know, okay, standard on the board, hand out this, push this button, so on and so forth. And so, so really what I'm here is I'm, I'm not hired to be a robot. I'm, I'm actually here to nurture and cultivate and um, develop as well as participate in a culture that's defined by these these values that we share, and 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 that I can feel confident that I understand what success is, because I think that that's one of the things that leads to a lot of this fear, uncertainty, and doubt is that there is no clear other than a test, and that's even for whatever that's worth, um, what is success? And so when when these conversations happen, it brings everybody together around what success looks like and 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 also the rec realizing that success is not singular in terms of its path, in terms of what it is that affects that. It's actually success has many elements and and those those elements of success are things that are a spectrum. You know, it's not all or nothing. And so we can see that for ourselves as teachers, as practitioners, as school buildings, as districts, and also in our students. And I think it just makes everything much more authentic and and um, and for you know for me joyful because it's like, wow, we have a lot. We have a lot of ways we can go, but we've accomplished a lot. And there's yes. a lot of things that we can look at and say, you know, well done. Um, Anything else you'd like to add? Any anything you'd like to make sure folks take away from this before we we're done for yeah. today? I think we covered a lot. We did. We covered a lot, didn't we? All right. Well, thank you, Judy, for your time, and and everybody else who's who's listening to this. Um, it's a. I feel like it's a it's a it's an important conversation. Not always, um, in some respects, the most concrete, or or um, also with exactly you know silver bullet but i think um i think what we talked about today i hope helps a lots of folks if anyone would like to reach out to us you can you can reach us at noadam.com and um through contact us and we also have many supports to to support support instructional visions on our resource section of our website at noadam.com so thank you all for your time and um wish you the best of luck in dealing with fear uncertainty and doubt as adults in your classrooms <laughs>